good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rita Lucarelli. I'm a professor of Egyptology of Near Eastern Studies. Um, and well, this lecture is not uh, about Egyptology, but I also am interested in digital humanities. I'm a digital humanist myself by now. I do a lot of uh, photogrammetry and I uh, uh, work uh, for applying digital humanities uh, to Egyptology. And um, it's been uh, really nice for me to meet uh, Ajati uh, through a colleague in Digital Humanities uh, from Stanford who introduced us. And uh, uh, I was happy to organize this lecture for Ajati because the topic is also relevant for my own work. As you know, in Egypt we have a lot of heritage uh, to save uh, and uh, visualize uh, with also immersive experiences. So I read just a short bio of uh, Ajati. Dr. Rajati Bernadou is Senior Research Associate at the Digital Curation Unit at TIDA, RC, and Research Associate in Information Studies at the University of Glasgow. She has taught Digital Curation at the Department of Communication, Media and Culture at the University, and is currently teaching Digital Methods in the Humanities at the Department of Informatics Athens University of Economics and Business. And she is here only for this week, unfortunately. <laughs> she already gave a really engaging class um, for my course of Digital Humanities and Egyptology. So I'm really looking forward now to hear this new lecture entitled Immersive Experiences and Difficult Heritage, Past Lessons, Challenges Ahead. Really, great <laughs> yes. title. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Berkeley. <laughs> so thank you, Rita, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, I've come here all the way from Athens, Greece. Um, and just a few words about myself so that you can sort of have an idea of uh, where I'm coming from. My training has been on ancient history and archaeology. Um, and I have been working in the field of the digital humanities for quite a few years now, over a decade. Mm. But um, as, just, to, just to make sure I've said it, I'm not an IT specialist myself in any way. And this is going to be my approach. Um, so as Rita um, said, my um, affiliation is dual right now. So I'm, um, I'm attached to Athena Research Center in Athens, Greece, and also the University of Glasgow. And what I'm going to be talking to you about this afternoon is going to be um, a three-part, so to say, three-part um, research, um, a three-part paper and research I've been carrying out with the themes of Glasgow and Athens, um, and hopefully I'll have um, I'll have lots of reactions from you. Now, as Rita said, this is a very kind of a pompous title: immersive technologies and difficult heritage. What have we learned so far from our work, and what are the challenges that li that are lying ahead? Just for the background. So what do we mean when we talk about immersive technologies? What are these things, you know, what are these digital experiences that we are describing? So these are, the immersive technologies can be perceptual and or interactive. I'll come back to that in a while. Uh, that sort of distort the boundaries between the physical world and um, the, the, the digital, the simulated, so to say, world. So it, these are the experiences in which the user or the visitor, if we're discussing you know, a museum setting, um, feels part um, of the experience as a whole. So all spheres of the attention get, um, get immersed. So we can get sensory immersion, audiovisual, I'm sure you understand that, all factories, smelling, does the smell have any role in these sorts of experiences? Haptic, when we touch things, um, and so on. And also challenge-based immersion, like interaction, when, when the visitor or the user does something and expects uh, the system to respond. And of course, imaginative immersion, when we have a narrative that allows reinterpretation of any sort of, um, any sort of um, um, element that we are concentrating on. So the perceptual types that I discussed um, just before are basically 3D. 4D, which is a combination of 3D as well as non-analog experiences. So basically, 
you are within a 3D environment and you touch something, this is considered to be um, 4D, or, or also when you smell things, when you get water sprayed at you. Um, these are things that um, um, theme parks like the Universal Studios, of course, have um, engaged with for a long while now. Of course, the full dome in which video projection is around the dome and you get immersed into a very particular kind of a visualization. Holograms, you see them, you tend to see them in airports lately, but you can get them in museums, you can interact with holograms, um, that you can let them narrate a story for you. And of course, VR, we all know what VR is, I'm not going to giving you um, a class uh, here on VR. Augmented reality, which basically blends virtual reality with the physical world. So it's a form of enhancing our perception of the physical world through the digital medium. 3D audio and surround systems, as well as haptic technologies in which we use our hands or our body um, to perceive through the digital medium different aspects of a digital object. So these were the perceptual types. These are the things that the techies, so to say, or our friends, the, the engineers, design and implement for us um, as parts of immersive experiences. So just to make it clear, immersive experiences can be any one of those types or any combination of those types. So you can have 3D and a a AR, you can have haptics and uh, in a dome, you can have any sort of combinations around them. So what we experienced this morning at the SEDIS lab was an immersive experience, of course. It was a VR, it was, um, it was pretty, pretty straightforward immersion. But then come the interactive types. So the types in which um, the user or the visitor um, get some input of some kind, and then the technologies read the input and react to the reaction of the user. So, Siri, here in San Francisco, I noticed everybody uses Siri. Siri is a, is a means of an interactive experience. So you say something to a machine effectively and the machine responds. Alexa, Google Home, and of course, um, all these gaming platforms and <coughs> environments such as PlayStation, Xbox, and so on and so forth. Um, brain computer interface technologies, which provide direct pathways of communication between um, a wired brain and external devices. These are all interactive types. So these are the types in which something is expected from you and the system responds. So while we, in, in 2019 or 2020, um, now, where we're nearing um, 2020, Immers immersion is part of our everyday life, effectively, not just uh, in our interaction with cultural heritage, but as well as any, any sort of interaction um, with, uh, with culture, but in our everyday sort of life series and all those things I described. But what happens when it comes to user experience in heritage sites that employ immersive experience to enhance visitor, um, visitor satisfaction. So as part of our work in, uh, in, the, in the University of Glasgow, we carried out a large scale quantitative and qualitative analysis of, the, of, of user experience and visitor experience in sites across Scotland that have been um, working with the digital quite extensively. And at this point, I'd like to show you a video that tells everything much better than I do. The Scottish Heritage Partnership was established by an EPSRC <laughs> AHRC Award on Immersive Experiences. The partners are the University of Glasgow, Solus Heritage, the National Trust for Scotland, National Library of Scotland and Glasgow Museums. Its goals were to explore the audience data of immersive experiences of all kinds in Scotland 
to provide evidence for design and procurement values in immersives for the heritage industry. Its core questions were, how successful are the current approaches to immersive technologies at major heritage sites in Scotland? What kinds of future development in procurement and design are supported by this evidence? Tourism is a £6 billion business in Scotland and there are some 17 million visits annually to heritage and culture sites in Edinburgh and Glasgow alone. Immersive experiences are on the rise and audiences are changing fast. The Scottish Heritage Partnership collated new data for government, cultural and creative industry use. We asked visitors how they responded to the immersive experiences at a number of sites and any issues they experienced. We surveyed sites with mixed immersive experiences, including VR, video games, surround video, multimedia rooms, reconstructed interiors, and themed outdoor spaces. What kinds of immersive experience are best? Audiences like immersive experiences, but prefer mixed virtual and physical experiences with a blended experience and a strong storyline. Content was regarded as important irrespective of the mode of delivery, less gimmicks and more content. Intangible heritage requires a thickening of the narratives of contemporary museological practice. Under 35s are the most comfortable with entirely VR and digital based experiences. Audiences prefer the option of handling objects alongside the experience. The reaction has been entirely positive from what I've heard. People have really enjoyed being able to see the digital versions of the models and then perhaps see some reconstructed objects that we have and then to see the object in the gallery. So that variation of, of ways of looking at material is, is proved to be very stimulating, I think, for people. I think we're always looking for new ways of complementing the collections and our reason to be as a museum is to try and reach the widest possible audience and we see virtual reality as a new way of reaching audiences who perhaps previously haven't found the museum as inspiring or as, as, as accessible as they might through virtual reality. Physical objects are best but even virtual object handling is preferred to a purely virtual environment. What is the site demographic and do I want to change it? Can it replace guided tours and audio guides completely? How will it enhance interpretation and content and for whom? What is the balance in the visitor experience between a recreated and a virtual environment and why? How will touch complement sight in the VR elements of the experience? Will certain demographics experience nausea from 360 immersion? Will audibles be needed? And if so, can they be subtitled? What other accessibility considerations would be needed? How many of the five senses are you reaching? Does smell have a role to play? What kind of exciting and substantial narrative is needed to make up for the lack of a social dimension in VR? Can digital content be available in part to engage more younger adults and children? How can we personalise content? Where will the immersive experience be cited and how will it be mixed? with existing content to maximise audience response? What physical material should the immersive project enhance or work in conjunction with? What is the value added by VR or AR 
and does it justify the maintenance and development costs of ongoing technical upgrades? <coughs> VR or AR or haptic delivery? What is the comparative efficacy, objectives and costs? SHP findings using data from six sites strongly suggest the need for mixed immersive experience, additional digital resources for younger demographics, strong high content narrative, object handling. We'll be sharing our detailed findings with Nesta and Scottish Government. Company 
they um, put together an, a VR experience called the Day the World Changed, which, which focused on the Hiroshima event. So basically, you were one of the inhabitants of Hiroshima on the morning that the, the bomb dropped, and uh, in your um, goggles you could see what was happening around you, so you were actually standing and looking at people dying, looking at the, at the uh, buildings falling, um, falling apart, getting the, the, whole, the whole terror in front of your eyes. Now, this was never commercialized, you can find a, a video on YouTube, but um, this was never taken forward and adopted by a museum, so to say. So, immersion in difficult heritage is a kind of a touchy, touchy thing. For, for the Egyptologists here, the Gabelay Man, uh, currently in the British Museum. Now, this is an actual mummy that has been preserved in an excellent way. Uh, dates back, Rita, correct me if I'm wrong, to 3500 before Christ. So it's a pretty old thing, but the, the ginger hair on his head are still visible. And he's a young adult, um, he's crouching, he's very crouching, he's naked. And for years, people could only see this thing in the British Museum. It was actually in a, in a glass um, frame. Um, down on the floor, people almost tripped on him, right? Um, difficult heritage is not just buildings, and it's not just notions. Difficult heritage is not just the Holocaust, and it's not just Hiroshima, or not just the actual site of Auschwitz. This is also difficult heritage. I'm sure you agree. You, you agree. And it's, it's because it's a human body, and despite the fact that it's so old, that has no chronology, as you know, um, it's very well preserved, so it can, be, it can be a bit unsettling. So what did the British Museum do? They just, they just came up with a very simple idea. They um, used a screen, a touch screen, an interactive screen, um, with which the um, visitor could basically interact with the actual mummy, touching it and exploring the way and the the, the, the context of its de of the person's death. So he was stabbed in the back, um, and uh, depending on where you zoomed in, you zoomed out, you could basically find out more about this dead body using the technology. Now, this was a way to mediate, to attract attention to the actual uh, exhibit. Uh, the British Museum found that the per percentage of people visiting the museum just to make use of that screen, and then obviously look at the body that was right there, um, increased proportionately. And also they figured that the re that standing time, people stood to actually, look, to actually look at the mummy, was much higher when the screen was set up than beforehand. So you felt that the, so people felt that they had some sort of an interaction with the actual object, an interaction that was in fact mediated by the digital. So, I have a question. Sure. Um, was the body still on display? Yes, so it was right next, right, right, right behind the screen. I mean, you can really okay. see it. So you could see the body, and you could just the digital was a way of not touching the body, but actually interacting with it. There have been lots of publications about the Gabelay Man and this sort of system that they did, and this has been years now, I think it's five years ago that they actually did a pretty simple thing. It's not VR, it's not augmented, it's nothing like all those fancy things I was describing beforehand. But what, what we can see here is that we have what, what the Scottish Heritage Partnership identified as a key um, as a key um, um, as a key finding in the, during the research, but it's a mixed immersion, basically. You have the actual object, and then you have the digital, and you interact with both. You can see the one, and you can touch the other. Now, the Battle of Bannockburn that I was telling you about, okay, it should Here's what they did. We're not going to see the whole thing.
classes. I know you're about to have an immersive experience and go back to 13, 14. So, do you come this way? So, the visitor centre was updated. There has been a visitor centre there since the 1960s, but it was updated um, to mark the 700th anniversary of the battle. It's been described as one of the most important events on British soil and defines the relationship between Scots and the English. One of the challenges in Bannockburn is that nothing, no objects, have actually survived the 700 years since but the battle. Totally so unlike a tr traditional museum or visitor centre where you're studying objects and maybe reading graphic panels or maybe even potentially watching a film about something, that just wasn't possible in this. So we had to take a completely new approach to interpretation. So how do you actually mix the immersion well, where you have get the audience to sort of divide into two armies and actually simulate the battle, them fighting uh, each other, and uh, so that they go through the sim a similar kind of thought pro So you divide the audience into two teams, and you have them refight the battle, and you randomly, yes, just give me a minute, and you randomly, you ran randomly allocate each member of the audience to the English or the Scots, so you may be a Scottish nationalist, and you may end up playing for the English, for the English army. And actually, while you play, you may end up reversing the history. That was my question. <laughs> like, so what that the commanders can the audience to choose? Um, mm -hmm. Basically, you'll have the, the English on this side, and the Scots mm -hmm. on this side. At the moment, the army of the Scots is actually training, so they're taking it easy. Um, and then suddenly you may be immersed in the middle of a battle, or the middle of the actual battle on the second day. What you're seeing on screen has been reproduced in terms of the weaponry here. So you've got things like a war knife, axes, crossbows. These are reproductions. Even right not, down not the very they would wear themselves. And that gives you an idea, not only are you immersed in, in the period through the interactive technology, but you can get an idea of physically what it must have been like. But most of it is motion capture. And then it's basically then computer generated with, based on the research of the academic panel. The faces on the individuals have been scanned on by real human beings. Real humans. Um, as well as as well as the interactive high definition technology, we have touch screens here as well. So what these do is these will give you further information on how you actually play the game. So for example, before you take part in the game, you're learning all about the medieval life, and then you would go through here, and this will break the game down. For example, when you see the symbol, this means spearmen. If you see this other symbol, it means cavalry. And again, all this touch screen is, is a part of the learning curve, so you'll have a great idea when you actually take place what you're going to, what's going to happen in the battle, and then hopefully you'll win the battle. Be your English or the, the fight choreography and the immersive 3D space within which that takes place helps to tell the battle because. It's the step before people actually fight. So in that space, visitors are walking in practically fresh off the street, and we're trying to get them up to speed on medieval battle weapons, soldiers, and tactics, and, and just general warfare. And we need to do that in a really snappy, quick way, which doesn't rely on text, which doesn't rely on narrative voiceovers. So we designed a space that is a virtual space that when you sat inside that um, uh, sort of immersive room, although the room is probably no bigger than the average sort of badminton court, it actually feels like you're in the middle of a huge field because of the 3D depth. The ultrasonic were involved in the design of the, uh, the scheme. They were involved with the design um, in terms of risk. And throughout that whole process, I found uh, we always got the answers we were looking for from a design point of view. And then throughout the um, procurement and um, installation period, um, it exceeded the expectations, um, the big expectations that we, that we put out. So basically, this has been considered to be the most successful immersive experience in Scotland right now. And the reason behind it, of course, is not just the state of the art of the technology, is the disruption of the collective narrative behind the battle. 
it was pretty straightforward that especially smaller children, not kids, but like 9 or 10 or 15 year olds, they got really immersed. They really wanted to win, um, regardless um, of their own nationality. So you got Scottish kids really wanted to win for the English army and vice versa. I was, I was there to see. You can see families being randomly divided. So the dad and the daughter are Scots, um, Scott warriors, and the mother and the, and the brother and the little boy are, are, um, are English and, and so on and so forth. So taking this, taking this, these lessons learned and all these experience from Glasgow to Athens, we have designed an even more difficult um, proposal that's still awaiting final approval, and we hope we'll get it, I think we will, um, in which we'd like to reconstruct, virtually reconstruct, a building of a concentration camp that lies in the western outskirts of Athens, in Haivari, that's how it's called. It's a suburb. Um, the virtual experience will be centered around the first person experience um, of events and sites as observed and endured by the user character, which will be a prisoner. Um, so we will watch his interplay with and incarceration amongst uh, the other people held captive and learn about the place of the actual building through a story which unfolds through his interactions with officers, that should be Germans, cellmates, rumor spreading within the block, um, through the walls, as well as weighted, reasonable glimpses of torture and suffering. So this is what we'll try to do um, in, um, in Athens, hopefully under the auspices of the German embassy. Um, so this production, this is not part of the production, these are similar um, uh, stills from similar games that we've been looking at to look at the aesthetics of the actual um, experience. So this uh, production will be mixed in that it will combine story-driven exploration of the camp and its important <coughs> landmarks, um, interactive discovery of the facts um, through point trigger actions. Of course, this whole, uh, this whole endeavor will entail a lot of archival research and historical research. So we have on board our team some of the best um, um, historians of the, of the period that we work on that. And of course, we will employ um, non-commercial and free-to-use policy. Now, we're looking into ways in which we can personalize the experience. So I guess that a 40-year-old may not need to have the same experience of torture and pain um, as a 10-year-old. So we'll, we'll see about that. But this will be the first time that such a thing will ever be um, undertaken in Europe. So this is what I was telling you in class. What happens when we move near the time towards the 1945 events in, uh, in Greece and in Europe? How do you mediate that through the digital in such a way that's informative as well as educational? Because of course it cannot be entertaining in any way. So we hope that this will be a pretty impactful um, um, project. It will be the first one um, on a contested site. The difficult heritage, I guess, I, I don't need to go into, into any more um, reasons why this will be a very difficult um, heritage project. We want to enhance the understanding um, of the building. Bear in mind that despite the fact that this is a building effectively within the wider region of Greece, very few Athenians or Greeks know about it. It lies within a, a current army camp, so licensing and all those things will have to be resolved, but also it's not open to visitors. So the only way, and also it's a very old building, an olive tree has grown a lot, you know, in front of it, so the roots are sort of destabilizing the whole structure. So a VR reconstruction of it, it will be a sort of maintaining it for, for, the, for the years to come. We hope to renew the cultural identity of the region of Athens by letting people know that we did actually have a concentration camp in Athens. And also, as you know, um, Europe, is a, Europe is a boiling pot right now, what with the right wing, left wing, and all those discussions. 
So different sociocultural groups from different perspectives will have to participate in this, um, in this interactive experience and we'll, we're really looking forward to the user experience evaluation when this project comes to the end. And of course, and this poses questions to you because this is just a very, I mean, it is a sort of innovative um, proposal. Um, how objective can we be? Should we be? And why? Um, how far into the interpretation of the actual site can we, can we um, try and go into? Educational purposes, um, in what ways can this game be actually, can this experience, excuse me, uh, be actually entertaining um, and educational or not? Entertaining it will not be. Um, evaluation of visitor experience is, is part of our proposal and we need to see where this will take us. And of course, um, matters of pre preservation of the actual site, will it work like the Gabby Man, where the digital actually um, increased the interest towards the actual um, exhibit, the actual physical object, or not? So, this is all. <laughs>